Welcome to Thursday Dairy Update. This is Kathy Barrett with the Cornell Pro Dairy Program, and the Pro Dairy Program, along with Eastern Dairy Business, is pleased to be able to offer this webinar series. Today's presentation will be presented by Dr. Rob Lynch, veterinarian and herd health and management specialist at Cornell University with the Pro Dairy Program. He's going to be talking today about applied dairy immunology and vaccination protocol management. I really enjoy um, this topic, um, the area around immunology. Uh, mostly because it, it is some fantastic stuff that we have um, available to us to manage uh, healthcare. Not just animals, this all applies to people as well. And so I lifted this quote from a medical uh, textbook from uh, someone out at uh, UC Davis, and um, it, it really sums it up quite nicely. Uh, protection against infectious disease by immunoprophylaxis or immunization represents an immense, if not the greatest, accomplishment of biomedical science. And I, I think that's really true. We can prevent uh, disease by the use of vaccines, and uh, to have that um, have that at our disposal is pretty amazing stuff. So a brief outline for this, this afternoon. I'm going to just do a basic uh, review of some immunology, and this will be very basic. But I think if we're going to manipulate the immune system with vaccines, we need to first understand how the immune system works. Um, but this won't be uh, anything too crazy technical. We'll just try to a, a quick overview of, of how the immune system works. And this is mammalian immunology. So what happens in people also happens in cows. This is an example where we can uh, do some uh, comparisons between these two species. <laughs> uh, and then afterwards, I'm gonna get into some things that we know will impact um, overall immune health with, with cattle. Um, so things that will um, drive immune suppression and things we can do to try to minimize that immune suppression to keep, keep our animals healthy. And then lastly, get into some, uh, some strategies how we can uh, use various vaccines to uh, prevent disease and, and keep the herd healthy. So I thought I'd start off with a little bit of history and it's, uh, I think it's fair to give cows credit where credit is due. Uh, the word vaccine comes from the Latin origin vaca, which is of or from cows. And so this is probably review for many of you, but um, Edward Jenner, uh, back in the late 1700s is really credited as being the pioneer or, or um, godfather of vaccination science. And it was understood back then that for some reason milkmaids, uh, the ones out milking the cows, were not getting ill from smallpox, which was pretty much ravaging England at the time. And so with a little bit of deductive reasoning, they decided to do some experimentation and collect some of the uh, fluids from some of the uh, lesions on the um, on the milkers' hands and uh, inject that into some willing patients, we'll say. And uh, lo and behold, that conferred some immunity and they did not succumb to smallpox when later challenged. So uh, there begins uh, vaccination um, in, a, in modern medicine. Uh, many hundreds of years go by and lots of different um, uh, products were developed and put on the market for sale, both in animals and in people, and it dawned on on folks that, you know, we really need to regulate this uh, business because uh, we want to make sure that what's out there is actually safe and, and worthwhile. So uh, 1913, the Virus Serum and Toxin Act, uh, kind of the, the birth of regulation of, of biologicals um, in medicine. So if I fast forward quite a ways here and get into uh, modern day, uh, and we've got now um, USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service um, through the Center of Veterinary Biologics. So that's the arm of the, of the government that regulates the um, manufacturing, distribution, and sale of veterinary biological products, and that's vaccines, that's things for diagnostic testing, and for, um, and for treatment of animal disease, not just vaccines themselves. So if you're a biological company and you want to sell commercially here in the U.S., you need to follow USDA guidelines, be an approved establishment, and, and actually demonstrate to that agency that your products are pure, safe, potent and efficacious. So the approval process is quite rigorous. I'm, I didn't actually work in that division of, of the business, but um, I was um, made aware of just how rigorous and uh, involved this process is. So I just want to hit some of the highlights of how these things come about when they, they make it into the refrigerator for sale. So in order to um, put a biological on the market, you know, really, it starts with manufacturing. Can, can you demonstrate to USDA that this product can be manufactured in a safe and repeatable manner? And so they're looking at things like the master seed, where the, the, the vaccine um, virus originates and how that gets uh, propagated on into the uh, various uh, cereal batches and what ends up in the final product um, 
for, for sale and administration. Along with that comes some potency tests to make sure we, we kind of validate the fact that yes, by giving this much antigen, this much virus into test the animal, that it elicits the response uh, that we're going for. We need to also demonstrate efficacy, absolutely. So does the administration of this product in a, a labeled manner elicit the response that we're going for? You know, are we preventing disease to a significant degree? So efficacy studies have to be done. Um, and that's not just, you know, animals that got vaccine, how sick did they get versus animals that did not get, get vaccine, but can, can this antigen be mixed with this other antigen? We've got lots of vaccines on the market with multiple different um, virus labels on there and bacteria labels on there. So can these antigens still elicit response when they're mixed together? Um, what kind of duration do we expect to achieve from this, um, from this vaccine? How long can we expect them to last? Uh, if we're going to give these vaccines to young animals, uh, we need to demonstrate that, yes, in fact, we can get a, an immune response even in the presence of maternal antibodies. And I'll get into that um, in, a, in a little bit. It obviously needs to be a safe product, and safety is actually a pretty broad category. It's got to be safe in the animal that we give it to. It doesn't create um, lots of adverse effects from the administration of the vaccine. We don't want to make animals sick from the vaccine. We're trying to prevent disease. We also want to make sure that the product, that the animals that are intended for food are safe for human consumption later. So there's, there's food safety parts to these approvals. Um, the you know, how efficacious these vaccines are in combination. We also need to prove that they're safe in combination, that they don't lead to um, adverse health events when mixed with other antigens. We have to make sure that the virus strains are stable and safe, that um, viruses don't revert to virulence or um, get shed and create disease in non-vaccinated animals, so that's included as well. And obviously safe for the user, that you know, people who are handling and administering these vaccines, they're safe as well. Stability is pretty important. We need to know, and it's stated on every vaccine bottle or box, that you know, what is the expected lifespan for these products? We put out a number of antigens or a, a volume of antigen load, and then it's going to sit in a refrigerator stored properly for some period of time. And how long is it before we start to lose um, efficacy of these products? And then last uh, is actually the, the, all the documentation, the labels and everything that um, that label states this vaccine can do as far as handling and administration and, and efficacy and health benefits uh, that, that the verbiage um, meets USDA's uh, requirements. Around 2002, USDA uh, CVB released a, a memorandum that um, kind of broke out um, how we can, what we can actually stay, say about a vaccine's um, efficacy on the label inserts. And so um, briefly, it just says the data must be there that supports the indications that accurately reflect what kind of performance we should expect in this product. And they boiled it down to like four or five label claims. And I'm just going to list them in reverse order. Um, so if it, other claims, it's other is never really a great category, but if, if your label on your product says um, something other than prevention of disease, um, it's a, it has some sort of benefits, but not directly related to disease control. So it's, we call that an other. Next uh, uh, step up the ladder is AIDS and disease control. And uh, so that's exactly what it says. It helps reduce maybe the, the length of disease, uh, it delays onset of the disease or just how sick the animals get. They still get the disease, but they're, but they're, they're not as affected um, by use of this vaccine. So it gets an AIDS and disease control label claim. Next one up the ladder is AIDS and disease prevention. This is the most popular, most common vaccine claim out there. Uh, if you look on your package inserts, you'll see uh, plenty of mentions of um, AIDS and the di uh, disease prevention. And so it will prevent disease by a clinically significant amount. Um, not 100%, but it will significantly reduce the amount of disease you see by use of this product if used correctly. Next step up the ladder is prevention of disease. So this is either by nature of um, just dramatic and proven over-control animals, usually involves multiple uh, challenge studies to um, convince uh, USDA that um, the vaccine performed to a level to achieve a prevention of disease claim. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty high standard to meet there. And then the, the highest label claim, the hardest to achieve, is not just from a disease standpoint, but a vaccine with a prevents infection claim uh, really prevents all colonization and replication of the challenge organism. So 
just another step beyond the disease itself. So that kind of gives us a framework of what we can, what can we expect from these products when you're reading your labels. It's all in there. Um, it can be a little confusing because one vaccine can have multiple different label claims for the different fractions that are in there. And it, it does make for a bit of a challenge as far as making sense of these label claims, but um, it's uh, important information nonetheless. Uh, just to make everyone aware that uh, actually in 2011, it looks, there's, there's discussion and uh, a movement where it looks like maybe that multiple tier label claim system is going to go away and we'll, we'll, uh, USDA will adopt a single tier label claim um, approach going forward. So new, new vaccines that go in for approval will, will likely be subject to the single tier label claim strategy. And that's based on some feedback received from some biological uh, manufacturers and from the American Veterinary Medical Association. Um, just some comments about how confusing and how maybe this system uh, maybe was too confusing and didn't end up with a whole lot of useful information for the end user. So, so based on that, that feedback, uh, they proposed, and I'm not sure where this uh, sits today, but um, there's a proposal to move to a one, they all get the same label claim, and then we're going to actually, bullet point number two here, is actually warehouse all of the efficacy and safety data on a, on a website where end users can then go and review all this data to um, learn what they need to learn about the products and making decisions on how to use these vaccines. And so I guess uh, verdicts or juries out a little bit on um, how this is going to pan out, uh, but um, at the end of the day, we're going to just make information available so people can better understand what to expect from these, from these vaccine products. So I'm going to do a little bit on some immunology 101, and I'll uh, be right up front here. These, uh, these uh, animations are very crude. Looks like a 10-year-old a, a may have made them, but it was me. <laughs> so, and I, I, like it, I like to think of it this way. We have, um, we have a level of immunity, and we have some level of disease challenge out there. And so as long as my immunity, and that's a generic term, is over my disease load, I remain healthy. But that doesn't always pan out. And there are times where there's just so much disease out there, so much challenge, that it, it overwhelms the immune system. And so we can think of situations, um, but, you know, I, I think of when kids head off to school in the fall, uh, they get into that classroom and there's other kids in there with their various colds. And there's, you know, the immune system didn't really change effectively, but there's just so much um, pathogen in the air and that exposure takes place and, and they end up coming home and getting sick. Uh, we can think of a cow, uh, a, a cow heading through the parlor, gets a proper milking procedure, units are hung and she's milked and she doesn't get mastitis, but we just happen to forget one of those teats in the prep one, one day and we end up milking that teat that didn't get properly clean. And so her immune system didn't change, but we may have overwhelmed her immune system and put too much bacteria at that T-end and she ends up getting mastitis. We have uh, kind of the flip side of the coin that can happen. Maybe the disease challenge didn't really change significantly, but her immunity waned um, through various stressors, and there's a bunch of them, but we can take her immune system down a notch. And what normally she'd have been able to fight off and not get sick, uh, she no longer can resist those, those uh, regular challenges and she, she breaks the disease. And we'll get into some of those stressors here in a little bit. So we can try to um, lower the chances of, of disease and illness by minimizing those stressors. Uh, we can do that through a good um, balanced diet and just good comfortable housing and basically minimize the chances of suppressing that immune system. And then we can um, be very targeted and specific and raise the level of immunity to specific diseases with vaccination. And vaccinations are very specific to the disease that they are uh, designed to um, help fight against. And so we can raise the level of immunity by the um, proper use of vaccines. We can also lower challenge, and we can do that uh, a number of ways, just through good hygiene, good biosecurity programs, and good biocontainment strategies to try to lower that regular risk of exposure that's going to take place on the farm. And I look at that difference, that spread that we're trying to um, achieve here, um, lower the challenge and raise the immunity um, that, I see that as what a herd health program is all about. Now, the wider we make that gap, I think the healthier and the, the lowest risk uh, category we have for our animals. So a little bit about the, uh, I guess, the players here. 
So immunity is just a natural or acquired resistance to disease. Uh, I like to think of the immune system as basically like a military. Um, and we break it into small parts to better understand it, uh, but it's important to remember that they all kind of work together. We can, the first branch in this, in this tree is uh, basically the difference between innate and acquired. Innate immunity is nonspecific, and it, um, it's not very efficient, but it's there initially. It's, a, it's the first thing that keeps disease um, out and the first thing that responds to disease when it comes in. So we may not think of it this way, but uh, simple like physical barriers, like an intact skin or the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, um, the mucosal lining, the, the, mu the mucus lining in your respiratory tract, those are all part of actually the immune system keeping disease out. It's just not, you know, white cells and T cells and B cells. Uh, they're nonspecific, but basically the first barrier that keeps disease out, out of the animal. And then we have our adaptive or our acquired immunity. And this is the specific um, portion of our immune system. And this is what's so special about um, um, mammals in general is the ability to look at a disease element and then build some sort of memory to that disease for so later on if it sees it again it has that ability to respond to that uh, in a robust and, and um, expedient manner to prevent animals from getting sick at all so we can break that into a couple pieces as well and conveniently we'll just break it into humoral immunity or b cells and uh, cell mediated immunity or t cells so our b cells these are our antibody makers and everyone's familiar with antibodies. That's all the, all the antibodies and colostrum that we're feeding calves. Um, those are produced by plasma cells and uh, that generate antibodies that are very, they're built and designed to grab a hold of, of foreign, um, foreign invaders, whatever they are, bacteria, viruses, uh, you name it. And their job is to lock onto those things um, that specifically that they were built against and help the immune system um, eliminate them. And they also can acquire some memory. So when the immune system sees an antigen or sees a, a challenge for the first time, um, what's, what's really special about um, our immune system is we build memory. And we'll remember that thing for quite a while. So uh, we, we're just better equipped to fight it next go-round. The cell-mediated immune branch of the immune system, those are your, your T cells, your T helper cells, your T killer cells. Um, these are really... Um, pretty much involved in that initial immune response. They help drive the immune response in one direction or another or to one organ system or another. Uh, they help the B cells generate antibodies. They, they help um, macrophages do what they need to do. Uh, they release a lot of their own um, immune mediators through cytokines and interleukins and other, other immune um, chemicals to help uh, with, the, with the general immune response. But they're also involved in that adaptive response um, going after intracellular organisms, and I'll get into a little bit of that uh, later on. But we need our T cells. They're just as important as antibodies are to, a, to our immune function. And uh, using both arms of this immune system is pretty critical to keeping animals healthy. They also generate um, memory cells to this. And I just put in a comment here that, that it's difficult to measure. So we often will use antibody levels when we're trying to assess for um, vaccine efficacy and response. And that's because they're pretty easy to measure. Um, you can measure the cell-mediated immune response. It's just a little more uh, complicated and probably not something that's practical on a, on a commercial level. And then we have the local immune system. I'll get into that a little bit as well. But that's a, it makes sense to build up our military around places where we're likely to get attacked. And so our immune system is, is the same. It will, it will build up a specialized immune ability, um, immune function, where we're likely to get invaded. So the upper airways, our GI tract, you know, these are common uh, places of entry for, for pathogens. And so it just makes sense that we're gonna build up a specialized localized immune function in those places where the diseases can get in. And just another reminder that these things all work together, that we, we break them out into separate components so it sort of facilitates our understanding, but they communicate and the T cells are releasing mediators that influence B cells, and the local immune system is is um, releasing um, mediators that will drive how those plasma cells respond and which antibodies are creating and where the T cells are going to um, react and where they're going to where they're going to traffic. So 
uh, all these systems do uh, communicate. So here we have a, a diagram, and at the top we've got a couple of bacteria hanging out, and we've got our, our, our skin. This is the, the kind of the first barrier to keeping disease out. And I just wanted to highlight those little red projections on the surface of those bacteria. That would be, it's, it's basically its fingerprint, it's its antigen. And all living organisms have some sort of antigen um, on its surface that sort of says, this is, this is me, this is my fingerprint. And so those antigens are pretty important in driving an adaptive immune response, and I'll get to that in a second. And so we, these bacteria are doing no harm, and uh, they're, they're on the outside and not creating any kind of health concern. But um, mistakes happen, and you probably have, you know, made, accidentally had a, had a cut out on the farm, and some of these bacteria uh, make it through that first barrier. And so now we need to rely on um, the rest of the immune system to help get these bacteria uh, cleared up and, and out of there. So the first responders on a lot of these um, um, infections would be our, our, some of the neutrophils and our macrophages. And they're trolling around and they're kind of always on the lookout for something foreign, nothing specific. They just kind of know what's supposed to be there and what's not supposed to be there. And so these bacteria make their way in and the macrophages will see them with some T cell assistance. We'll go and grab them up, we'll swallow up those bacteria. And which is good, it gets rid of the bacteria, but it, it takes it a step further it's going to break down those bacteria, find those antigens, and present them. It's going to put it out on the surface of those cells. It's going to go find some of these, these um, B cells and T cells and show them this antigen and say, look, what just came in. Uh, we need to respond to this. Um, and we, we, we call on the adaptive immune response now. So our B cells then go ahead and lock on to that antigen, make more B cells, make these plasma cells, and generate antibodies specific to that bacteria. These antibodies, their job now is to go find more bacteria just like them and grab them up and help the rest of the immune system get rid of those, those bacteria. And there's also that cell there with an M on it. That's our memory cell. It's gonna make these memory cells and they're just gonna kind of hang out to the side and wait for some time in the future where we need to remember what that bacteria looks like. So with T cells, very similar. Um, they are specific to antigen. They bind onto that, to that antigen on the macrophage, make more T cells specific to that antigen, and also create memory. So if we want to break this out, humoral antibody B cell uh, arm of the immune system on the left, the uh, adaptive immune system cell-mediated immunity T cells on the bottom right, and then everything that happened above that we call innate or nonspecific immunity. So the second go around, that bacteria happens to come in again, that same bacteria. I've got memory. It's sitting there waiting, and it can ramp up an immune response so much more efficiently now that it already recognizes this pathogen and can upregulate and overwhelm this, this invader with antibodies because it has memory in place. Something unique about viruses, let's say instead of that bacteria, we had a virus that came in. Viruses are, you know, they're odd little fellows. They, they can't really reproduce themselves, they need to take over the machinery of other cells to make more virus. So uh, pretty clever, they'll go ahead and invade some, some cells, and maybe it's a respiratory cell, or maybe it's a GI tract lining cell, but it's gonna go in inside that cell and take over the machinery and make more virus that way. Uh, so that's bad in itself, and that's you know really where a lot of the damage is done when, when we do get a viral infection. But so those cells are taken over and antigen from the bacteria actually gets um, uh, put out there on the surface of this, uh, this infected cell and it's basically flagging itself saying, I've got a virus in here anymore. I'm no longer a, a respiratory lining cell. I'm a virus manufacturing factory. So it will um, it'll present those antigens on its surface. And our antibodies, they're out in the circulation. They don't do a real good job finding these infected cells with virus inside. So that's where we're really gonna lean on our cell-mediated immunity. These viruses can move from cell to cell and really hide from those circulating antibodies. So we've got some memory in our T cells that were uh, hanging out and waiting. They make uh, quickly ramp up and make more T cells. They will bind to those in, um, infected um, um, cells of the body and, and uh, take them out along with the virus that's inside to minimize how much virus gets manufactured and released throughout the rest of the body. So here's our anamnestic response or our immune response. And it's sort of kind of laying low, 
um, on the bottom there in the bottom left, and then we get some sort of initial exposure, that primary look at this antigen or this pathogen. And just like you and I, if we're exposed to a cold, exposed to the flu, uh, we're sick for a week or so, our immune system will finally get around to getting it gone and, and we get over it. But we were pretty sick for a while while we were dealing with that. The second time we're exposed to that same virus, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got the ability to, to fight it off now because of the previous exposure. So now we get this robust and overwhelming Im immune response. And that's, that's strictly because we have memory in place from the previous exposure. So without memory, it's like we're starting over every time. When it comes to vaccines, this is, this is how we're using vaccines. We're creating that initial exposure to make memory, but we're doing it without having to go through that initial illness. So vaccines mimic what the, what the, what the uh, pathogen's gonna do without all the uh, nasty side effects. So we have memory on board from vaccination, so the first time our cows see that disease, actually their immune system has sort of seen it already and can mount such a rapid and robust response that we didn't even, never even knew the exposure took place if, if the vaccine's doing what it's supposed to do. So there's things we can do to, in general, suppress the immune system. So an overall down-regulation of what's, what the immune system's capable to uh, fend off. And there's lots of things that can do that. And I'm gonna probably not do any of them uh, the justice that they deserve, but um, basic nutrition, so overall, just the, the macro diet, so the enough groceries, enough calories getting in, enough access to feed, um, and micronutrition. So those micro minerals, those vitamins, all those, all those little ingredients that go into the rations are very critical to maintaining proper immune function. Uh, environment, heat stress, cold stress, all these things have an impact on how well the immune system works. Other diseases, things like BBD and Yonis, we know suppress the immune system. So by having one disease, it just makes them a higher risk of coming down with others. A parasitism uh, really takes a toll on immune function. So heavily parasitized animals can't fend off other diseases very well. There's social stressors, things like overcrowding and resocialization uh, within the herd. And those, those stressors also have an impact on them. And then some of the, the management strategies that we just, you know, the day-to-day -day of, of, of what we need to do with these animals, um, weaning, uh, transporting from barn to barn, just basic management strategies uh, we know can be a stressor on cattle. So we try to do these things in ways that minimize that, uh, that, that stress. Some stressors are unavoidable. Uh, we cannot, <laughs> we should not avoid um, birthing new calves or cows having calves. So those are two known stressors and uh, uh, there's nothing we can do about them, but there's, those are necessary. So thinking of that newborn calf, and I think one, uh, one common misconception is that calves have no immune system. They actually have a, um, a underdeveloped, but a functional immune system in utero, uh, somewhere you know, halfway along the way through um, fetal development. They actually have an immune system that can see disease, respond to disease, and fend off disease. Um, it's not great, it's not very functional, but it's there. Uh, but when they hit the ground, um, it's that that lack of uh, a significant um, immune system that makes them pretty uh, pretty much sitting ducks for uh, disease challenge. And so that's why we spend so much time harping about colostrum management because we want to get a, an adequate amount of antibodies into these calves to to buy them some protection over that very critical uh, neonatal period till their immune system gets up and going. So we, we, we all know the benefits of a good colostrum program. It's been well established in the, in the research. Um, calves that get a good diet of colostrum just get off to a better start, um, lower chance of disease, lower chance of mortality. They grow better. Uh, it's cheaper to raise them. And when they grow up and make, start making milk, they produce more milk than, their, than the, their herd mates that didn't get enough colostrum. So that's well established. And knowing the value of that um, colostrum program, I'm surprised to see the results of the most recent National, National Animal Health Monitoring Survey uh, data. Um, they're just starting to release the 2014 survey results. So I quickly went in and pulled out a couple of pieces. And uh, one thing I, I noticed is what percentage of farms indicated in their survey uh, that, uh, who fed uh, more than two quarts of colostrum. Really only about a third of the survey respondents said that 
they routinely give three or four or more quarts of colostrum uh, to their to their newborn calves. So surprised to see that. Also surprised to see how uh, few indicated that they routinely monitor for this passive transfer success. That's pretty uh, easy process, and expensive process to keep tabs on the herd's uh, immune function or how well they're getting antibodies into their calves. So we can monitor colostrum quality, uh, with various ways to measure uh, what kind of immunoglobulin content we're, we're, we're finding in the colostrum that we feed to calves, and a pretty easy and expensive way to uh, check the, um, the blood of, of calves, young calves, to see did those antibodies actually get into the bloodstream. So these, these two testing strategies are simple enough, but when asked if they do it routinely, uh, only 6% of uh, dairies indicated that they routinely check calves, serum proteins for passive transfer, and only a little over 15% uh, routinely monitor their colostrum IgG content. So lots of opportunities to, to do a little bit more of that, to, to know where we are from a passive transfer standpoint. For the dairies that did indicate that they routinely measure serum proteins, this is now 2007 data. They haven't, they haven't released the 14 data yet on this particular metric. Um, we have just under 60% of calves with what's considered an adequate passive transfer. So lots of, uh, lots of opportunity there to drive those uh, passive transfer rates up and, and to help calves get through this neonatal period. If you want to monitor this on, on the dairy, um, just keep in mind the goal here is not more quarts of, of colostrum, but we want to get immunoglobulin into the circulation of these calves. And so our, our goal here is greater than 10 milligrams per mil. A proxy of that is... Uh, is looking at serum protein levels in these calves. So you want to grab a group of calves somewhere between two and seven days of age. And you can either test all your calves or you can do a, a subsampling of calves. But we're looking for what percentage are actually um, achieving adequate levels of, of uh, passive transfer. It's important to remember that uh, we're going to run these samples at uh, room temperature and we're going to check healthy calves. That if you've got a calf that's scouring significantly, she's probably dehydrated. That's not going to give you an accurate serum protein. Our goals here, we want serum proteins greater than 5.5 milligrams per deciliter, and we want to have less than 20% uh, of the calves uh, falling below that, that, um, that threshold. If you're using a BRICS meter, uh, we're going to use an 8.4 or less, and we want to have less than 20% of calves uh, falling below that threshold. And then severe failure passive transfer, I'll use two or 5.2 um, grams per deciliter because uh, that's, that's what uh, Sheila McGurk at University of Wisconsin recommends, so um, we'll, we'll definitely go with that. We want less than 10% of our calves falling below that, that severe failure passive transfer. So easy enough to monitor, and, um, should, should be a, a routine. I borrowed this from uh, Dr. Chase uh, from the Vet Clinics in North America, Food Animal Practice publication because uh, it really highlights nicely that the bit of a challenge we're under when we're trying to vaccinate young calves. And so this kind of shows in time and uh, how much antibody is around. And so we can see that if we get a good colostrum feeding any of these calves, right off the bat, our antibody levels are high. Those are specific to pathogens that mom generated in her colostrum and passed to the calf. And those are protective. And as long as we can keep those levels above a certain level, uh, we can protect a lot of uh, disease challenge those calves. But antibodies break down over time, and there's a pretty uh, a predictable uh, half-life to these circulating antibodies, and they will go down and decrease and decrease, and it will get to a point where they're no longer protective. Meanwhile, the calf's own immune system hasn't quite um, developed enough yet to uh, respond adequately, and so we're looking at a, a bit of a, a risk window until they can actually generate their own specific antibodies to fend off disease. So I label that as the window of susceptibility. That's that, that gap when we, we know they're at risk, but uh, they, they haven't had an ability to, to mount their own response yet to, to protect them. An added challenge here is um, there seems to also be this, I may not have enough antibodies on board to fend off the disease, but there's enough around to get in the way of a, of a good immune uh, response to vaccination. So that's a really a, uh, a double whammy on these calves. They're, they're still at risk of getting disease because the levels are, are lower than needed, but yet they're still high enough to get in the way of responding to vaccine. So then we're always faced with that dilemma. When do we start vaccinating our young calves? 
we we want to vaccinate them as young as possible to to minimize their their risk window. But if we go too early, there's too much maternal antibody around, and we just don't get the response that we want out of that vaccine. Then flip side of that coin is we wait as long as possible to make sure that they're all down below that that uh, level of of antibody that's going to get in the way of vaccine response. So they're all likely to respond to vaccination, but we've really kind of left that window open for so long for the actual disease to, to hit. So we're always trying to uh, play that, play both sides of that and try to figure out what's the ideal window to, to vaccinate my, start vaccinating my calves. It's also important to point out that not everybody follows the same number, that animals will carry various levels of antibody. And so their antibody decline will put them at risk at different ages. And so just because you may have, we may be right on one, we could be wrong on, wrong on the other. So sometimes we find ourselves vaccinating a little more often, um, even, even though we know some aren't responding initially, just to kind of cover our bases and make sure that we, we've got the antigen presented at a stage of life that they're, they're going to respond and minimize how long we're at risk. We also have a, um, you know, the situation of, of herd immunity. And so this kind of, I think this helps us in a lot of ways because we don't have to be 100% perfect. And so we've got to, and we take advantage of herd immunity in human medicine all the time. Uh, there's uh, little kids, um, a lot of vaccines, that are, we just don't use those in little kids. But if we can get the herd vaccinated, if we can get the adults all vaccinated, now the prevalence of that disease is just is not around, so their exposure isn't there. So I've got this herd of 50 cows, and I vaccinate and get almost all of them to respond to my vaccine. But there's a couple of girls there that, for whatever reason, uh, maybe I didn't find them, maybe I missed them, maybe they were just having a bad day and they didn't respond. Um, they did not get the benefit of that, that vaccine. But all of their herd mates did. And so the overall um, risk of how much disease they're likely to get exposed to in this environment is, is lower than had we not vaccinated the rest of the, the, rest of the group. So we're, we're, these girls are going to benefit a little bit from that herd immunity because most of their herd mates are protected. So we talked a little bit about calf immune suppression. Uh, cow immune suppression is um, another, another issue we need to deal with. Periparturian immunosuppression, it's not a well understood phenomenon, but we know that, calf, that cows around the time of calving have immune suppression. And it's been pretty well documented in the literature, um, cortisol or adrenaline. Uh, we know suppresses the, the how well white cells can actually do their job. Uh, we know that non-esterified fatty acids, uh, NEFAs, a, a byproduct of, of fat mobilization around the, when cows are uh, recently calved in and they're breaking down body fat, high levels of non-esterified fatty acids will actually directly uh, negatively impact uh, white cell function, all the things that we can do to try to assess how well white cells are, are doing their job. Uh, a lot of those are impacted and we can measure that in the presence of high levels of NEFA. Subclinical ketosis we know leads to other diseases like clinical ketosis and metritis, and so we know there's a, an element of immune suppression there as well. And hypocalcemia. We, we know cows that, that they're just not operating at, at high enough levels and they're circulating calcium, and every cell in the body, including immune cells, need calcium to function correctly. So we're, we're impairing their immunity by not having the calcium levels where they need to be post-calving. So well, then we're faced with this added challenge. We, we often vaccinate in this post, recently post-fresh period. Uh, we, we like to give these uh, coliform mastitis vaccines early on in lactation because that's when the risk is highest for coliform mastitis. And we often will start our virals and our, our lepto vaccinations, uh, you know, a good about you know, 30, give or take a few days, somewhere in there. Basically, in that fresh window, we're, we're vaccinating cows that may be um, still dealing with a, a fair bit of immune suppression from calving. So we know these, are, these work and they're beneficial at these stages of lactation, but if we're dealing with excessive immune suppression, things that we can manage, uh, we're going to have less, uh, we're going to get less bang for our buck from, the, from vaccinating in these stages. So let's, um, where we can identify opportunities to minimize those stressors, Let's try, to, uh, let's try to manage them so we can uh, keep, keep the herd healthy. So I'm going to uh, jump into vaccine protocols now, and I thought it would be pretty important to at least start with kind of 
there are lots of different immunological products on the market. And I do run into a fair bit of um, kind of some, some mix up of thinking we're using one when you're actually using another. And so pretty important to read these labels and make sure you're getting what it is you're looking for. And we can break them up into some general categories. And I'll start with just passive versus active immunity. So passive immunity is, is exactly that. I'm providing some short-term um, immediate protection to a specific disease by using uh, passive immunity products. And we know those as um, antibody preparations like E. coli, diarrhea antibody preparations, antitoxins like tetanus antitoxin. Uh, there's no immune response taking place here. I, I made those antibodies somewhere else, and I'm delivering it to the animal when she really needs it. So she's not mounting an res immune response to this product. Um, she's, we're just giving her some short-term immunity to that specific disease when, when we know she's challenged. Uh, these, these tend to be a little more reactive, so a little bit tougher on the animals. So um, you know, keep the epinephrine handy because sometimes uh, they don't, don't react to these types of preparations. Versus um, active immunity. So now we need the immune system to do something. And so I give a vaccine today, it's going to be a week or two or three till that immune system's had a chance to deal with the antigen, mount a response, and confer some sort of protection as a result of that vaccination. So if I gave the vaccine today, she's not protected tomorrow. It's going to take her a little while to mount that response. But the upside is once I get that immune response mounted, it's longer lived. There's some memory built there. And that's what we're trying to do with vaccination is, is generate the memory. And so examples would be our modified live virus vaccines, our bacteria our toxoids, and so uh, those products with those um, names on them, those are, that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about vaccines. Within the, um, within the vaccines category, we can break them down into live versus killed, and so we've got modified live vaccines, which have their, their pros and cons, and so we know modified lives do a nice job of stimulating uh, both branches of the immune system, and I'm generalizing here, uh, but you know, see there's some general uh, things we've come to understand with how these vaccines behave. So we get a, a more robust, a broader immune response. We get a, a, we drive both the humoral and the cell-mediated uh, branches of the immune system with, with live virus preparations. Um, I'd start to confer some immunity right away, right off the bat with a single dose. Uh, not that um, there's no benefit to later boosters, but I can, I'm starting to see some immunity right off the bat from one injection. Uh, they tend to carry less antigenic mass and they're um, antigen, or, um, adjuvanted um, a little bit lower. So reactivity rates on live virus vaccines tend to be a little bit lower compared to kill. And on a cost per dose basis, they do tend to come up a little bit cheaper, but um, that you have to have enough animals to, to use those doses when, when first mixed. Cons would be, uh, it's a bit of a, uh, they're, they're delicate, so you have to handle them carefully. They have to be stored correctly and mixed correctly and administered correctly. Um, you can't just put this back in the fridge and, and expect to have anything useful later on. They have to be used up within the next hour or two after you mix them. And they're not safe for all classes of animals. So you read your labels closely and make sure you're following the directions that you don't want to accidentally give um, this product to an animal that it's not safe to give it to. Over on the killed virus vaccine side, again, uh, lots of pros and cons to these. Um, no unused doses, and I, I put a little asterisk next to there because if you read your read your labels, it does say that you got to use these entire contents when first opened. And so, um, uh, particularly if care isn't taken in how these products are are um, drawn from and stored, um, you can really create a pretty um, pretty uh, not a vaccine anymore. I guess we'll put it that way if if, you're, if we're um, not careful with how we use these products. They do tend to be uh, safe in all classes of animals, and there's a convenience there where. You know, I, I know I can give it to everybody, so I can, you know, this, today's vaccination day and everybody gets vaccinated. I don't have that worry of who can get it, who can't get it. Uh, they do tend to be a little more heavily adjuvanted because they are killed products and their, their ability to um, generate an immune response tends to be a little bit narrower than with a modified live virus that has a chance to get in there and replicate and behave like a, like a virus normally would. And so they do quite a bit to these things to amp up their, um, their effect on the immune system. And sometimes uh, the downside of that is we get, a, we get some uh, higher chance of uh, vaccination reactions. Most of these, not all, but most need a booster. And so killed virus vaccines, just by nature of how they elicit an immune response, 
Um, I have to come back later on, typically three or four weeks later, and give another dose before I see any any degree of immune protection from these products. And if, and if I, in my protocol, I don't have that booster dose in place, well, I, I, I just don't see a whole lot of use in giving the first dose. They tend to be a little bit on the higher cost side. They are uh, pretty expensive products to manufacture, uh, so a little bit higher cost per dose, but you have, a, I guess, a higher likelihood of getting your doses used up. So um, we kind of have to look at those economics again. Then along comes intranasal vaccines, and uh, this is uh, taking advantage of that one part of the immune system I mentioned earlier, that, that localized immune system, where we've got specialized cells, special immunity built up around the likely uh, sources of exposure, the places where disease is likely to come in. And so our respiratory tract is lined with some specialized cells, dendritic cells that are really good at finding antigen, processing antigen, and getting it to the, the rest of the immune system and helping the rest of the immune system um, deal with this, this challenge. So it helps drive that immune system to where it needs to be, back in the upper respiratory system. And um, so it's nice to be able to elicit immune response or get an immune response at those locations because those are the locations best um, built to, to handle it. Um, we don't often get exposed to cold viruses um, deep in one of our muscles from a, from an IM injection. But we are likely to see uh, cold viruses when we inhale them. So um, the intranasal route products have the added advantage of delivering antigen to where the cells are likely best to respond to those antigens. We're also a um, little less impacted by that maternal antibody interference I mentioned earlier, that those, those maternal antibodies that we work so hard to get into the calf by feeding colostrum um, tends to get in the way of a good immune response with a lot of our um, parenterally in, administered vaccines. But the intranasal route doesn't avoid it 100%, uh, but it does help mitigate that. We do tend to get a, uh, an uptake of uh, vaccine response even in the presence of maternal antibodies. So I included a, a couple of studies here just to kind of highlight that difference. Um, so this is a, a approval data for um, the Zoetis Enforce 3 intranasal product. And so USDA um, requires that animals that are challenged for these vaccines they have to be negative, so they can't have already seen this, um, this virus and already have immunity to it. So you take these negative calves, and you, some get vaccinated and some don't, and you wait three weeks, and then you challenge them to that, that strain, and this one was the bovine respiratory syncytial virus challenge, and you compare how well these calves did compared to the non-vaccinates. And so I just included the mortality numbers here, and you know, significant reduction by a long shot in mortality percentage, calves that got the vaccine versus calves that didn't. So those were negative calves, and so we're working very hard to make calves that are actually not negative to various antigens. We're, we're delivering antibodies via colostrum, and so we want zero positive calves to these things. And well, so is this vaccine going to work when mom's antibodies are circulating? So maternal antibody override studies are pretty important. If we're considering using a vaccine in a neonate where maternal antibodies are likely to be present, it's nice to see a challenge study where um, we've, we've assessed that. So um, if that's in the cards and that's a vaccine you want to want to introduce into neonatal calves, um, look, to, look to see some uh, maternal antibody override data to, to prove that it's going to actually elicit a response in that age group. So when it comes to uh, protocol implementation, uh, I like to start with a risk assessment, kind of know so what diseases are out there? What, what are the likely exposures um, to happen? How open or closed is the herd? Uh, what, where are our risks? Where are the chances of disease and which diseases are we most likely to need to prevent against? Uh, I like to consider facilities, facility limitations. Um, it's all well and good to want calves vaccinated at six months of age, but maybe calves that are six months of age on your dairy um, are nowhere convenient to get a hold of. So it doesn't do me a lot of good to give you a protocol that tells you to do it at six months when the likelihood of that happening is pretty low. We want to make sure we, we have the labor and um, we have the, a way to actually successfully and conveniently do the vaccine protocol consistently week after week, month after month, year after year. And so all these need to be uh, considered in our risk assessment of how it is we want to build this vaccine program. And then we start selecting vaccines. So we're going to look at that data. We're going to see how, how's the efficacy for the diseases that are of concern to us. 
uh, how safe are these vaccines and the animals I want to give it to, and it ought to give us a good indication of the timing. When do I? When should I give it? How often do I need to give it? Uh, do I need to booster this product? Um, we're going to learn all that from the label. And so all of the vaccines have a tremendous amount of information printed on their labels or within their inserts. And so although the font is incredibly small and difficult to read, there's a lot of great information on those things. So things like which animal class can it go in? Um, how old? Pregnancy status? The dose, route, frequency? Do I need to boost it? Are there any particular precautions or warnings I need to be aware of? Um, how do I store it? When does it expire? Um, uh, meat withhold. Uh, USDA mandates that there is a, a, a basically a meat trim out uh, withhold recommendation. So I want to make sure I'm adhering to that with, with my animals as well. So read your inserts. They change often. So um, just keep tabs on, on as, as we learn more about vaccines, that all goes in the insert. Uh, I wanted to highlight duration of immunity studies because it's pretty important um, to know when to redose. And if I don't know how long the vaccine lasts, I really don't know when to put in the next dose of vaccine. So duration of immunity studies um, are submissible to, but not required by um, CVB, uh, but they're very useful, uh, particularly when designing vaccination protocols. And in a nutshell, uh, DOI studies are just, just that. I have my target population and I vaccinate them, and then I basically hold on to them for some period of time. And then I challenge them to whatever that target pathogen is at the end of my, my um, hold period, and I give them that, that minimum immunizing dose of, of – well, I'm, actually, I'm giving them the challenge dose of pathogen at challenge time, and I'm vaccinating with the minimum immunizing dose at the start of the trial. And so the – the trick to these studies is obviously we'd like to run them really long. Um, we'd like to push that out, that duration, as long as possible because then I don't have to give as many doses. But the longer you hang on to these groups of calves, the more likely there is that something goes wrong, something gets in, something changes with my study animals, and then the study gets, um, gets kind of ruined. So uh, we like them as long as possible, but realize that they're pretty complicated trials to run. So. But if I know a vaccine lasts 270 days, well, now I know for sure when I need to go back in and give another dose because the duration of immunity study has given me that guidance. Does it work longer than that? I don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but we look at the, the DOI studies to say exactly when we know how long that immunity held up. Uh, protocol monitoring, like, like any other uh, procedure on farms, uh, how those vaccine programs get implemented and used, um, that needs to be monitored because there's just ever-present drift in what's going on with, with um, protocol implementation. One way to do that is just to assess your overall inventory. Um, vaccines are uh, pretty regular-use products on dairies. We kind of have not a steady state of calves coming in and cows freshening every year, but um, or every month or every week, but we have a, a rough idea of, based on protocol, roughly how many doses or how many bottles really should have been consumed over X period of time, six months, 12 months, one month. And so you can tally them up, and that maybe that's something simple as just looking what's in the trash can or tracking your purchases and changes in inventory in the refrigerator to see, are we, are we way overdoing it? Are we using double what we should be using in this vaccine, or are we using half of what we should be using for this vaccine? Are we actually following the protocol as written? So it's pretty important to, we'll never get it dialed into the exact number of doses, but we can get within a ballpark to tip us off that maybe, maybe we're not adhering to protocol. We also want to keep tabs on how successful is this protocol? Is it still meeting our needs? So um, having accurate disease definitions and monitoring um, disease incidents on farms will will give us a rough idea of, you know, if we're having a significant increase in coliform mastitis, maybe we need to take a look at our coliform mastitis program and see if the vaccine um, strategy needs to be reevaluated. And it's really important to observe vaccination procedures. I don't know any other way to double check on how well the protocol is being run without just watching, watching vaccines get mixed, and get administered. And so um, like, like heat detection, it's a very good use of time just watching the job get done to make sure that um, there just hasn't been procedural drift and uh, making mistakes out there and ending up with product that's not doing what we needed to do. 
And protocols often need updating. So new products hit the market, um, new disease challenges rear their head. And so um, part of this uh, protocol management is just uh, updating when necessary. So I'm gonna share a, a case example. You might remember this one. It was written up in Dairy Herd uh, several months ago, but um, it's not uh, unusual to hear stories like this. We've got a well-vaccinated herd. Uh, they test a sick calf. She turns out BVD positive. So we never like to hear that. Uh, do a little bit of back checking and do some BVD screening on some calves and then cover multiple persistently infected heifer calves within the facility. This is a well-vaccinated herd. So, um, you know, this might be when the tech service veterinarian gets a phone call, hey, your vaccine's not working. Um, but uh, luckily enough, this, um, this herd and this veterinarian did a, did a fair bit more investigation and identified, you know, went back to those uh, vaccine purchase history records and noticed that, wow, there's, they're just not buying enough vaccine based on what the protocol uh, for this farm is. Went back and reviewed the standard operating procedures with the, all the farm employees and figured out that, lo and behold, those heifers were not getting vaccinated per protocol. They hadn't seen the vaccine when they were supposed to be seeing the vaccine. They were naive. So uh, unfortunately, neighbors' cattle must have got loose, got out uh, onto their farm and were just found wandering up and down the feed bunk uh, enjoying some TMR. And so what we have here is a naive group of animals of, of pregnant heifers exposed to uh, the BBD virus and there we've got a we've got our break in the in the protocol. So important to just monitor, just keep an eye on protocol drift. Um, it's a it's a it's a common occurrence, and it's probably the thing I run into the most out there. Just you know things aren't happening uh, day to day with the vaccine program um, as written or as expected. There's always new challenges, uh, new products uh, hitting the market, and uh, new people uh, just coming to work at the farm and may not um, understand the importance of uh, how how um, how to handle these products correctly, and we just see it time and again that the protocol is, we'll just call it disorganized. That not everybody is doing the same thing. Not everybody understands that um, why it is we 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 give it at this age and give it this way and give it this time and give it this route. So um, working on that on a regular basis will help um, uh, head off any of those uh, avoidable problems down the road. Other things we run into pretty commonly, um, we run into storage issues. Uh, those household refrigerators um, that probably ought to go to the dump end up uh, holding a lot of pretty valuable vaccine. And so just keep tabs on the temperature in these things. Uh, vaccines are to be stored between 35 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see some pretty major fluctuations in these old units. Um, they'll freeze. And so everything inside them will, could, could freeze or they'll just get warm especially if you're holding all that vaccine in the in the egg carton or the butter container or on the, on the door. Uh, those, those parts of the refrigerator get a lot of temperature swings. And anytime these, temp these vaccines are exposed to temperatures above that recommended storage temp, they break down and you start losing efficacy, you start losing virus. Colostrum often gets put in these refrigerators. So you take a five gallon vat of 102 degree uh, milk and put it in a refrigerator full of vaccine and you'll, you'll warm that stuff up in a hurry. So pretty reasonably priced devices. I think this one goes for just under 50 bucks. Um, we'll actually um, track temperature and record for you the high and the low for the day. So you'll, you'll know pretty quick uh, if, your, if your refrigerator is actually holding the temperature that you need it to hold to, to hold your vaccines. Pretty good monitoring tool for um, managing your vaccine program. Um, we run into protocol uh, issues all the time. Um, products that need boosters often uh, run into issues where they're not getting boosted, uh, so we have to keep an eye on that. Mishandling of vaccine, uh, modified live virus, um, is, a, is a delicate product, so exposure to sunlight will damage these vaccines. Exposure um, being mixed and not getting used in a timely manner, anything over one or two hours, um, it's going to lead to a, a, a degradation of those products. Vaccination of cattle in high heat. So over 85 degrees Fahrenheit, I've been told, is uh, a, not a great time to round them up and, um, and run vaccines. Um, watch your uh, stacking of vaccines given at any one time in dairy breeds. We try to limit the number of gram negatives that go into, uh, go into an animal at any one time to two. And so I put a little table down here in the bottom left of what we consider common, 
not exactly gram-negative pathogens, but fall into that kind of gram-negative uh, endotoxin risk category. So look at your protocols and see how many you're giving at, at one time. All right, so I think I did go over just a couple of minutes. I hope that's okay. Um, yes, Rob, that's fine. This is Kathy again, folks. Um, excellent presentation. But we do have someone who's uh, put in a question, so folks, if you can hang on a few more minutes so we can um, answer some questions, I think that'd be um, a good thing to do. Um, so I'd encourage folks, now's the time. If you want to ask a question, um, type it in. In the meantime, here we have a question. Um, it says, I vaccinate newborns with infants enforced within first week. If I have a calf that scours some, not down and out sick, gets put on, calf gets put on electrolytes. Should I wait to vaccinate until feeling better or vaccinate anyway? May end up 10 days to 14 days um, old before vaccinated if I wait. What's the best thing to do? All right, all right, well great, that's a great question because it kind of gets to that immune suppression of the newborn calf. Um, and so I guess if you feel like the calf is sick enough to go on medication for the scours, I would say a calf is probably too sick for vaccination. Um, and you know, there may be some wiggle room there. It all depends on how serious the risk of uh, uh, respiratory disease um, is for those young calves at that age. But I'd say animals that are going on medication for an illness, we probably ought to hold off vaccination until they're, they're up and, and, and healthy again. Uh, the downside to that, some of that is could forget about her. Uh, just because farms are busy places, so you just want to make sure you got a system to make sure that we don't accidentally um, not vaccinate that calf later on when she's over her scours. This is Kathy Barrett again, and on behalf of the Pro Dairy Program and Dairy Business, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to view this webinar.